Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Camille Kerr. I'm the research director at the National Center for Employee Ownership, and I'm joined here by Paul Hudnut, who has many hats, but a couple of them are a board member at New Belgium Brewing and a professor at Colorado State University. I'm also joined by Melissa Hoover, who is the executive director at the U.S. Federation for Worker Co-ops, and Dermot Hickish, who's the director of business development at B-Lab. And what we're here to talk about today is something that I think will be increasingly important as this sector grows and matures, and that's succession planning. And succession planning is a hot topic in general right now. It's not unique to the social sector. It's something that, because of our demographics, is becoming more and more relevant to businesses. There are millions of baby boomer business owners right now who will be transferring billions of dollars in assets. And most of them will be transferring it in the next decade. And the vast majority have no succession plan. And Marjorie Kelly, in her book, uh, Owning Our Future, The Emerging Ownership Revolution, calls this the legacy problem. And what she mentions in her book is that we need to preserve the things in our organizations, in our companies, in our social enterprises that, that create impact. And the earlier you start planning, and this is a theme that you'll see throughout this presentation, the earlier you start planning for succession of your, of your business, the more options you'll have and the more likely you'll be to have a successful transition plan. And in this context, what I would call a successful transition plan, and we don't have a lot of examples to draw from in our sector, but what I would call a successful transition plan is one that respects the values of the organization, of all of its shareholders, and of all of its other stakeholders. So with that, let's look at some of the options that are available to us. And I think I need a clicker. <laughs> oh, it's up there. Thank you. So let's look at some of these options. And social enterprises have both conventional options and alternative options for a transition plan. And the alternative options are to sell to employees, and there are different ways to do this, and the one that the National Center for Employee Ownership we encounter most, the one that's most um, prevalent in the United States is through an Employee Stock Ownership Plan, or ESOP. Other types of employee ownership plans, you can do it through a different type of trust. It's not very common in the US, but many of you have heard, I'm sure, of the John Lewis Partnership that has a democratic governance structure in the UK, one of the largest retailers in the UK. There's also cooperatives, which Melissa will touch upon a little bit more. And you can also sell directly to select managers through leveraged buyout or other means. There are also dual class share structures. And you'll hear about this in terms of newspapers often, like the New York Times. Um, the family that has owned the New York Times maintains those shares that are voting shares where they're still publicly traded and there's still other outside investors. Also, there's Novo Nordisk, which does diabetes um, insulin, and they have a dual class share structure where a foundation owns all of the voting shares of stock. So they maintain governance while still being able to have investment. You can also, unlike a conventional business, uh, social enterprises have a social mission. So they have the option of converting to a nonprofit structure depending on the type of public benefit that they are providing. But social enterprises also have conventional options available to them, and the ones that we hear about most are merger or acquisition. That can be a sale to a competitor, sale to um, a strategic buyer of some sort, or a sale to a private equity firm. Um, there aren't that many private equity firms currently in this space, but that's something that could change in the near future. There's also the option of going public. And just because you use a conventional option like selling to um, a competitor or going public doesn't mean you necessarily are giving up your values in the process. 
and Dermot will talk a little bit more about how becoming a benefit corporation can help you preserve those values despite using one of the more conventional options. And in general, we're looking also on a conventional side of things, there's transferring to family, which isn't at least in my experience so far, particularly relevant to this space, but it could be something if more and more businesses are embracing a social, um, embracing a social mission, there might be more that want to pass that down to family. So eventually we could start seeing something like that be an option as well. So when you're considering any of the options that you have here, there are a few things that you need to keep in mind. And one of the first ones, and we saw it earlier in your earlier panel, Paul, is what is your, what is your ownership structure? If you have outside investors, that's going to drastically limit your options because they are a shareholder that's going to have a lot of say in what your transition is going to look like. And if you're expecting to have shareholders, or if you're ha expecting to have outside investment, it's something you should really consider moving forward. What, how do I want to structure my exit, and will this investment affect that? Also, it's a big question of, is staying private and independent an important goal to you? For a lot of companies, that's very important. We want to stay small, we want to stay private, and we want to make sure we're carrying on our mission um, the way that we intend to. Others are happy to sell to a competitor, happy to scale, and the more impact, the more people they touch, the better. But you should know those questions going into it. Another question that will affect how you decide is, how do the founders or the current leadership that you have, how do they want to be involved in the business going forward? Do they want to keep leading the business? If so, selling to a competitor might not be the best option. And another one, and this will especially be important when we talk about co-ops or converting to a nonprofit, how important is how much money you get out of that transaction? Selling to a strategic buyer is going to have a different price tag. You're going to get less um, your liquidity than if you um, are selling to a strategic buyer, you'll get more liquidity than if you sell to a co-op or if you convert to a nonprofit, you likely will get nothing for that, for that transition. So those are some of the things that we need to look at when we're making these decisions. And another thing that I, wanna, I want to emphasize is that when you're making these choices, some of these transitions, like selling to employees, not only maintain your mission, but can increase it. Because your impact may be that you're serving a disadvantaged population um, and creating access to water, creating access to sewage that otherwise wouldn't be accessible. But when you sell to employees, you also have the added benefit of sharing the wealth that that business is creating with those who are creating it. So these transition strategies not only give you an option for maintaining your impact and values as you move forward as an organization, but deepening that impact and grounding your company in your community and sharing wealth with those who are helping to create it. So with that, I'm going to hand it over um, actually to Paul, and we'll get to your slides a little bit later there. <laughs> Okay, well, I, uh, I'm Paul Hudnut, and uh, I think the reason I'm on, my, on this panel is uh, I've been an independent director at New Belgium Brewing for six years, and we've been through this process of trying to figure out um, what I refer to more as liquidity than, than exit, because all the people are still there. We've just transitioned our, our capital structure uh, when we became 100% um, ESOP company at the end of last year. Um, as part of that transaction, we also became a B Corp, which I think has some interesting wrinkles about how you can maintain mission um, and, and embed some of those principles in ways that, that bind people who aren't your stakeholders now but uh, might uh, be interested in, in your company in the long term. Um, a little background about New Belgium Brewing. Um, often people say they haven't heard of New Belgium Brewing, but then I say fat tire amber ale, and they're like, oh, yeah, we know them. <laughs> um, but New Belgium Brewing is the uh, eighth largest brewery in the country um, and the third largest craft brewer. Um, they 
the overall industry is about $100 billion. Craft brewing is less than 10% of that. So for a long time, there's been tremendous opportunities for growth as people kind of rediscover uh, uh, the craft of beer um, and, and the variety of beer. And New Belgium has been positioned very well uh, through that, that growth period. But as the company, this has been, a, it, the company's 22 years old now, um, that's a long time. And um, over that time, the original owners of the company um, had developed, had, had built a company that had a great deal of value. And so as a board, we had to begin to explore, are there ways to, um, to harvest some of that value uh, for the shareholders? And that quickly got us into discussions as a, as a mission oriented company, um, what, what, would our, what would our options be? And we explored a lot of them over a fairly long period of time. Um, the other thing I like to point out um, is that we are a beer company. We are not saving the world with clean water or clean fuel or anything, and beer has been around for thousands of years. Um, so I think, I guess I hope what that does is encourage you to all think about what is it about how you make whatever you make or offer whatever you offer, um, what are the ways you can make that work uh, important? Because it is about more than making beer. And our mission sounds pretty hippy-dippy. It's, um, it's to operate a, a profitable brewery that makes our love and talent manifest. And that is pretty certainly not a mission statement that you would see uh, for a lot of companies. But it, it gets to what we're about and how important it is to develop the people in the company so that they feel like they are bringing that love and their talent to work every day. So while we in, explored a lot of options in this path, um, we kind of came back to the idea of really wanting to, to sell the company to, to our coworkers. And, and then that started us down this path of, of there actually are some firms out there that our investment bankers that specialize in this field and attorneys that can help you with that. Um, the, the way the transaction basically worked is the company borrowed a lot of money, both from banks and from the selling shareholders, in, able to, in order to basically buy out all the remaining stockholders. We were already about just under 40% ESOP owned, so this was going from 40 to 100, and the way we did that was borrowed money, bought those shares back. Um, I can't get into the real numbers of the transaction, but what I can say is we explored an IPO. We explored being acquired um, by other breweries. And as part of that, we began to appreciate the value of what our company was worth. And the ultimate transaction we did, we were able to, I mean, we were able to get a, a kind of a market level EBITDA multiple through, through financing. Now, right now, debt financing is kind of at historically low levels, which allows you to perhaps to do that. that that's certainly a part of, 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 of penciling these transactions out. But I think what we were able to do, and it was hard work, was to find kind of an exit price that worked well for our shareholders, but also allowed the employees to have some upside so that they weren't kind of under a structure that was not sustainable in the long term. And um, we closed that transaction at the end of last year, announced it to our employees in January. Um, and as part of that, we also had taken the idea of B Corp becoming a B Corporation to our employees and uh, uh, having them approve that structure I think what the B Corp allows us to do, first, the certification is a useful process to go through to kind of see how you compare to others. Um, and it's also, you go through this checklist and you're like, oh, we didn't do so well on that one. So it's kind of aspirational and particularly like, oh, somebody else did better on that than we did. Um, we should work on that. But the other thing it allows us to do is we were very cognizant of the fact that, you know, ESOP owned companies could be sold. Some big person, big company could come in and, and make an offer to our ESOP trustees. So part of what we also had to do was figure out ways to build in other things that would, that would, would in effect be sure that we had at least uh, many years of kind of, uh, of, of this path. So the B Corporation for us also became 
this process to go through really articulating what your corporate purpose is and embedding that into an acquisition policy that as board members, you know, we have fiduciary duties, but we can also follow these acquisition um, policies where we have to take into account all stakeholders, not just the owners and some other things. So I'll stop there and turn it over because we have some other great panelists too. So Paul's talking about one form of employee ownership, and it's the most popular form. There are thousands of ESOP companies in the U.S. employing millions of people. Um, some other examples would be King Arthur, Flower, Dansko. Those are both certified B corporations. But there are quite a few other forms of employee ownership, ones that are broad-based or ones that are focused at the top management. And when we're talking about, um, when we transfer it to, to Melissa, she'll be discussing cooperatives. ESOPs, what Paul was talking about, don't require democratic management or democratic governance. You can have governance, there is some level of governance that employees need to participate in, but not like with cooperatives, which you'll hear are generally a one uh, member, one vote structure. So tell us about how cooperatives can then be an option for smaller, possibly, social enterprises that want to maintain their values. Great. Yeah, thank you. So Paul did a great job of um, talking about the way an ESOP structure works for a large employee-owned company, and I think New Belgium is the proof of concept, uh, one of the many proofs of concept that 100% ESOP um, can work for a large company. And um, worker co-ops tend to be, they're another flavor of employee ownership, and they tend to, to be used with smaller companies. Um, and as Camille mentioned, there's a democratic participation in governance and management built into the form. Um, according to the co-op principles, it's a one member, one vote. Uh, structure that can take any number of forms. I think everybody's nightmare is is uh, cooperative means everybody votes on everything, um, and that's rarely the case, and, and never the case in larger co-ops. There's a sort of pretty sophisticated mechanisms for making different kinds of decisions at different levels. Uh, but the democratic participation is a is a critical part of cooperative ownership. The other part is, is the shared ownership. So a cooperative is a member-based form. It's a business, but it's a, it's a member-owned business that operates for the benefit of its members. And in a worker co-op, those members are the people who work in the co-op. Um, you may be more familiar with something like a consumer co-op, like your local food co-op or REI, where your membership is based on being a consumer or a producer co-op like Organic Valley where the co-op members are the, are the agricultural producers. A worker co-op operates along the same principles. The membership is just shifted to the employees. Um, and so what, when is a worker co-op used as a transition mechanism? Typically with smaller companies, it can use some of the same tools uh, as an ESOP does to, to do the buyout and to save the owner uh, capital gains, taxes on the transition, on the sale of the business. Um, it tends to be a good fit for companies where deeper democratic participation is desired. Um, it also tends to be a good fit for companies that want to preserve um, a sense of, uh, that want to limit growth or need or want to stay small. That's not to say that all cooperatives do stay small, but it's a nice fit for a smaller company. Um, just to give a little bit of context on worker cooperatives, they're sort of ESOP's little sister right now um, in terms of size and scope and scale. There are about 350 worker co-ops in the country. Um, they tend to be overwhelmingly um, small businesses, under 50 or 100 workers, um, concentrated on the coasts. Um, and located in sort of a real variety of industries. For those of you who are local, some worker cooperative examples are the Arismendi Bakeries, uh, the Wages House Cleaning Cooperatives, and the, the Big Daddy of Bay Area Co-ops Rainbow Grocery. Um, so, so those are worker-owned and run cooperatives. And in the U.S., we're seeing growth in the service sector and in the alternative energy sector in worker cooperatives, and particularly um, an increased interest in cooper worker cooperatives as a transition structure for small businesses. Camille gave some pretty um, strong statistics about the number of baby boomer retirements that are coming up, and we're seeing that experientially. Um, the owners are interested in exploring selling to their workers. 
one of the sort of largest, the largest worker cooperative in the world is in Spain. And it's sort of a, a guiding light for some of us in worker cooperatives here in the U.S. because it shows that a worker cooperative can be realized at scale um, and in manufacturing and in sort of all of the, the, the holy grails um, that, that we're aiming for. And that's the Mondragon Cooperative in Spain. And I mentioned that name, hoping that you'll look it up a little bit. Just some quick statistics. It's the seventh largest business in Spain. Um, it employs about... 85,000 people, it's all over the world, it's a multinational corporation, 250 countries. Um, so they've figured out how to do R&D and manufacturing in a way that brings worker cooperatives to scale. We're not there yet in the US, um, but I think we have a lot to learn from things like the ESOP community um, about how to reach scale with worker ownership. Um, some of the challenges and benefits of worker cooperatives, um, they're, they, we haven't figured out financing yet. We're still getting there in terms of a, a transition mechanism for financing. So it's a bit irregular in terms of uh, structuring that deal. Um, the benefits on the other hand to the selling owners are that um, the mission, really the social mission of the business has a much greater chance of being institutionalized. And the benefits for the buying owners are of course that they get to keep their jobs and keep the business in business. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a vehicle or a tool that's evolving, and as we're seeing increased interest, um, we're interested in learning from, from you all here at SOCAP about how you might think about transitioning um, to employee ownership, but also sharing some of our pretty powerful models. And another form of employee ownership that uh, I touched on briefly before and where we see a large scale is the John Lewis Partnership, and they have a democratic... Uh, they really translated democracy very literally into the workplace. They have a constitution. All of the employees there are considered partners. It's not a model that we've seen developed in the United States, but as we move forward with social enterprise, the world is kind of our oyster. As I mentioned, there are very few transactions that we're even referencing when we're talking about social enterprises that have scaled or been mature enough or whose owners were ready for liquidity or ready to move on. Um, it does seem like this tent might fall over, by the way, in case you see our <laughs> eyes jetting around a little. There's a lot of wind in San Francisco right now. But there are very few that we've seen successful or otherwise. So when we talk about these models, cooperatives are still in de development as a way to transition a business. But we should explore these. And if you are an entrepreneur, if you're a social entrepreneur, don't take anything off the table because you can use any number of these structures to make this, to make your business successful in the long term. So I want to talk to have Dermot talk a little bit more about how benefit corporation status, that corporate form, can help you pose yourself either if you want to um, go through a conventional option like sale or merger, or if you want to stay private. I, I know that New Belgium is you or is considering using it to pose, poise itself to stay private, but other organizations that other companies that you're working with are using it, leveraging it to keep their mission through a transition to say a public company or to a transition to uh, to being acquired by a larger company. <clears throat> yeah, and, and just just to add a bit of context before diving into specific case examples, just thrilled to be at SoCap again. Love this conference, so many great people here. Um, at B-Lab, we're very fortunate to be working with for-profits of every type, from sole proprietors to cooperatives and ESOPs to companies that are public already or going public. Uh, we've always started with uh, the, the entrepreneur at the mind at the very beginning, thinking, how can we uh, help redefine success in business? And these entrepreneurs are really thinking about succession from the very start. Uh, they want to be impactful for people, for planet, and for the shareholders at the same time. So really about the theory of being best for the world uh, comes to mind. Uh, at B-Lab, you know, we, we try to tackle this in three ways, and it's a, it is an ecosystem approach where it is interrelated. Uh, we, we look at this as far as certification, how do you look at a good company versus good marketing. We need standards to be established so that companies that want to maintain mission over time can actually do a health check and see what's going on. Uh, we need new corporate forms that actually allow entrepreneurs to live out their mission, 
for the long term and have control of their company for the long term. Uh, that's where the benefit corporation piece of policy has come in. Uh, it's been really thrilling. And we also need to enable impact investors uh, a platform to, to measure impact and quantify it in a way where they can channel capital to the right companies that are going to be the most impactful, that really meets the investor's mission and underlining goals of making profit and also having a real special impact in the strategies they have. So to that end, we've been working with Gears, which is a multi-stakeholder collaboration, a lot of action in SoCap on that, and launching now B Analytics, which is the platform to help that happen. You know, I think one last thing about our name, too, on B-Lab, we were founded in Philadelphia, and Philly has a long history of, of legacy within the founding fathers, and Benjamin Franklin in, in particular, and, and that's what we really embody as B-Lab, as a laboratory. We're trying to experiment here to create new models and new, new ideas that can really progress to a, a deeper economy, very much as Mr. Franklin did in the 1700s towards stimulating intellectual thought in the United States in a very early stage. Uh, B Corps are every type of industry. You, you're probably talking to a few of the investors in the room, from RSF to Farmland LP. Uh, and there's a number of them that are largest. For instance, Cabot Creamery is a farmer-owned cooperative. Uh, it would, wouldn't be the first one that comes to mind for many people when being a cooperative that it would also be a B Corporation. Uh, Patagonia is well known. Uh, Yvonne Chouinard uh, took a very strong strategy there to maintain the legacy of of Patagonia's mission as he looks to retire and, and move away from the day-to-day -day operations there. Uh, a couple other companies that have been really exciting, obviously New Belgium's on the panel, so I think we're going to dive into a lot of detail there. Uh, Dansko did go 100% employee-owned this year. Really great strategy by, by Mandy Cabot, the, the founder there, to think through how do we make legacy happen? How do I make Dansko be around selling great shoes for a long time? Uh, and then there's other companies like Indigenous, which uh, if you haven't stopped by the pit stop yet, they're, they're giving a bunch of entrepreneurial advice. And their approach to uh, sourcing the apparel has always been about a cooperative or a series of women-owned cooperatives throughout Central America. So they're, they're looking at this uh, not in their own business structure, but other structures that can really help maintain their mission towards moving people off the base of the pyramid and up, upstream in, into uh, a much more lively environment. Uh, I think I'd love to talk about Method today. Uh, there's been a, a, a recent acquisition there. And Plum Organics, as well, was uh, recently purchased by Campbell Company. Uh, and there's some, a really good story there. And, and Ben and & Jerry's will come up, as many people know. They've recently been certified as a B Corporation, uh, a real homecoming from all the, the, the drama that happened when the acquisition by Unilever happened several years ago. Uh, before moving into that, I just wanted to share some of this growth. And the exciting thing about this in, in reaching 800 plus B corporations right now and over 200 benefit corporations in the United States is that these are companies that want to think about succession for mission. It's not, it's not a hypothetical thing. These are living, breathing organizations built by entrepreneurs, led by entrepreneurs that are, if they're going to leave, they're probably going to start new companies. And we're, we're helping create the structure and the support to make sure that they can get a get ahead and stay ahead and, and maintain that mission throughout the lifestyle and ideally have the maximum impact. I mean, that's what we're all here for at SOCAP is about increasing our impact and doing it in the best way possible where we aren't compromising our values along the way. Uh, Benefit Corporation is gaining a lot of traction in the U.S. We've just reached 20 states. Uh, the exciting thing for us was this year Delaware passed it. Uh, which many of you know, 60% uh, of all Fortune 500 companies are registered in the state of Delaware. Uh, over a million corporations are registered in Delaware. This is the home of corporate law for the United States. And to see the, the governor stand up and say this is a free market, no cost, great approach for entrepreneurs to have an option to maintain mission over time is a real milestone, not only for us at B-Lab, but for everyone that is working in this new economy and, and realizing you know, we are trying to make a real transformation here, and this is a great option. Uh, you know, the, the debate about whether you can invest in a benefit corporation, whether you can see it su succeed, will go on. But I think the proof is already in, the, in the, the passing of the legislation and the number of new entrepreneurs that are taking it up, that these, these models are going to be successful and we're going to see it scale over time. Uh, so just quickly on what a provision is for a benefit corp reg legislation, it is still a C or an S corporation. You're still going to be taxed the same way you would be as a traditional corporation. Uh, you do carry a higher purpose for a material, sufficient impact on society and the environment. And that is the enabler for these entrepreneurs to say, I want to maintain a high level of performance 
that is sufficient, that is, that is scalable and material at the size of the company that I'm at. Uh, for any founder in the room, uh, this is probably really good, exciting for you to realize that you have the potential to do this as you scale and it adds a lot of clarity so those investors that are looking for you are going to be able to understand where your values lie and what you want to do in the future. Uh, it's a very attractive approach uh, and the, the ability to to make decisions still remains within the company. So what that means is the liability on the external side is not there. And there's a lot of perception that, uh, say, uh, an environmental nonprofit can now sue you because you're a benefit corporation. It's simply not true. The, the liability and accountability is still within the company itself. And so it's you and your shareholders that have the ability to make decisions on what is strategic for your company, what is impactful for your company. It's a very enabling type of corporation, uh, which is, which is Fantastic. So I'm going to pause there and transition back to Camille for a little more conversation. Well, Dermot uh, brought up the case of Ben and Jerry's, and we're going to hear about seventh generation as well. And for a lot of people, those two transitions are synonymous with a, say, sellout or failed um, mission preservation transition. But that's not necessarily the whole story. And I think it'd be fun to talk with the panel about what the different perceptions are on what those transitions meant, what sacrifices we have to make when scaling, do we have to make any sacrifices, or should we scale? You know, these are a lot of questions that we need to deal with as a community as we start looking at organizations mature and grow. Um, so, Paul, how do you feel about what Ben and Jerry's, that, the lessons we learned from the sale to Unilever meant. Um, okay. Well, I like Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> um, t uh, coffee Heath Bar Crunch is my, my flavor. Um, <laughs> so I think it's interesting. I, like, it's, it's very hard to know what happened behind the veil, and a lot has been written, and... A lot of people are kind of firmly on one side or the other. I, I think it's really cool that they've come back in as a B Corp. So I, um, and I think that must be difficult to do as part of a large multinational like Unilever. Um, I think the, there are a couple things, maybe I'll put it in the perspective of an entrepreneur. So I think there are a few things that Ben and Jerry's did that are still out there and available. So one of the things, as I understand it, is when they were just a small ice cream shop in Burlington, they began to raise money from the community and through kind of a, a limited stock offering. And I see that becoming popular again now. So for instance, um, Farm Power up in Washington State financed that way. And it's kind of a cool way to do small offerings, but those, those shares weren't restricted, again, as I understand it, and so they ended up in people's hands. Whenever you sell equity, that equity at some point is going to want to get cashed out. And, and so I think they started some things that they didn't really understand because they were ice cream makers, not, you know, financially, uh, necessarily financially uh, savvy entrepreneurs. Um, I think the lesson that is widely popularized around Ben & Jerry's is that, that some of the things they did stopped happening once the acquisition happened. And I think that's the, maybe the soul-searching question rather than dwelling on what had happened or didn't happen is, what's your vision for your organization? What would you hate to see happen if you sold, either as a founder or as a subsequent owner of the business as an investor? What are, what are kind of the things you would want to avoid? And I think really thinking that through. For us, you know, New Belgium is really a part of the fabric of Fort Collins. And the idea that someone could buy us, consolidate our brands, and move our brands to another brewery would, would tear the heart out of the company. So that was one of the things that, even if, when we were looking at acquisitions, for instance, was that that was going to have to be kind of a non-negotiable principle. Well, by being employee-owned, um, and having all our employees so embedded in our community. I mean, I just, we just had our big tour de fat in Fort Collins. We had 25,000 people dress up in costumes and ride bikes. It took two hours to run the parade through the starting. <laughs> like, it's a freak fest. That's part of what we do. We don't 
measure ROI on that. We don't have to because it's kind of like just this cool thing we do every year and every year it gets bigger and more people get excited about alternative transportation, but they also get excited about getting their freak on and just being different for a day. And I don't know how you measure that, but I'm really glad to be part of a company that gets to do that. And I think, you know, so there's this kind of negative of like, we would never want to see the brewery moved and this positive of like, we would not want to have an owner that wouldn't let us be freaky. So it's that kind of combination. I'll pass it on to my others. And as a way of background, you know, Ben and Jerry's um, was a real spotlight within values-based business getting acquired by a large multinational. And, and during the transaction, a, a local community group of investors in Vermont uh, got together and they, they made an, a market value offer to, to purchase Ben and & Jerry's and, and really try to keep it local. Uh, following that, Unilever upped the, their bids and uh, over a, a number of days and transactions and pressure on the back end, Unilever did acquire Ben & Jerry's. Um, what was interesting though is, you know, we, we looked at it and they, they were able to certify as a B Corporation two years ago uh, because they were set up as a wholly owned subsidiary. And we think the, the pressure now that we look back at all this during that time really opened the eyes for Unilever to say, holy smokes, we can't just gobble this, this great company up like everyone else. We need to like think about what's important to this company and, and realizing the linkage between, yeah, fun, great ice cream, uh, but the, the deeper layer of what was actually creating the brand value there. And that, as a result, uh, Ben & Jerry's kept the vast majority of the jobs in the local uh, Burlington area. They ended up uh, keeping all their practices the same. And it's to the point now where Ben & Jerry's can actually make their own uh, political statements on certain issues that they care about where Unilever might not necessarily agree upon that. Um, and for them to certify is really a, a reinforcing mechanism not only for their employees to say, hey, we are maintaining mission, they, they scored an 87, uh, they needed an 80 point to, to certify as a B Corp, but you can now look at it from a consumer or even a, a shareholder in Unilever and say, if this company uh, during the recertification drops below that 80 point bar and loses their B Corp certification, you're starting to see mission drift. And that, that, that's gonna be the potential for over the long term for any, any company that is uh, acquiring a B corporations and wanting to maintain that status is how, how do we maintain high impact and the high level of transparency that comes with it. Uh, I think we were excited to see uh, Plum Organics recently uh, was acquired just uh, three months ago by uh, Campbell, Campbell Soup Company. And, and for Campbell to do this, they, you know, it was the first time they looked around, they're like, what the heck is a B Corp? What is this thing? Why do you, why do you think it's really important to you? Uh, and over the course of the, the conversations about how the acquisition was going, uh, they subsequently decided to make uh, Plum Organics a wholly owned subsidiary as well to maintain Plum's mission uh, for the long term with the values attachment to local kids and healthy living uh, to make sure that the foundations were kept intact and the like. Uh, and, and Plum was able to show up on Delaware on the first day that the benefit corporation policy was enabled and, and with the support of their new parent company to say, hey, you're allowed to adopt this new corporate structure. We support it because this is what your, your brand value is about. This is what your essence as a, as a living, breathing organization is about. And I think, I, I, oh, go ahead. If I may, I think that <clears throat> that's a pretty valuable contribution that cooperatives can have to this conversation. The B Corp codifies um, that sort of multiple bottom line and I, and I and cooperatives ha feel a great affinity with that because we do as well. It's built into our structure and an internationally accepted set of seven cooperative principles that also codify that kind of multiple bottom line concern for community, member participation, dem democratic governance, you know, those kinds of principles and then an additional set of values that have been adopted by um, the Mondragon Cooperative that I mentioned in Spain, but American cooperatives of, as well, one of which is that capital is subordinate to labor. And if we're talking about creating a truly non-extractive economic model, you know, that, that I think can be a valuable um, sort of North Star. And, I understand that may be a controversial concept in this crowd. I put it out there because I think it's important to recognize, as Paul said earlier today in a session, um, that we are, uh, some of us are trying to create a fundamentally different system. And if we're using the tools um, that are available to us without sort of thinking about what the values and principles are that underlie those, then we may end up replicating the very things we're trying to change. So I think cooperatives can be valuable in that, um, in that role. Um, 
Well, let's discuss both sides of this a little bit further. So on one side, what she's talking about is different forms of stakeholder ownership and grounding ownership through the second generation with different stakeholders, whether it be the employees in, in worker cooperatives, the producers in producer cooperatives, or the community. And we have seen some examples. There's this bakery um, in Michigan, I believe, and it, it was a staple of the community. And when it was going out of business, and they had donuts there, and when it was going out of business, the police force all put in their private money into this bakery and renamed it Cops and Donuts, and they volunteered labor to keep this organization going even though the owners could no longer run it. And it's been successful and it now is, is a profitable and, and part of that is just that it's this exciting cops and donuts. It has flair to it and marketing to it. But also part of it is that it was a community staple and there's stakeholders that were there to purchase it. So there are a number of possible stakeholder models that are out there that we've seen very little of but that could develop. But on the other end of that, what role do you guys think that private equity is going to play in social enterprise as we move forward and as these organizations sail? We see, we see a lot of venture capitalism in the impact investing world. What do you think about buying more mature companies? Is it responsible in this community to buy a company in order to switch it around and sell it a few years later, even if you help it get more on its feet? So what do you think about that, Paul? I know you were on a more investing panel earlier. Um, you should keep asking me first. <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're in the mix. Um, well, I don't, I'm not aware of those. We did talk to some private equity firms and the, the structure that they're often willing to do is to put money in at a certain multiple and then take it back out at that same multiple. So if you're growing your your cash flow, um, uh, they, they can make a return for their investors. So that's not a full control transaction and it's kind of what happens if you're not able to pay them back was kind of what the, the issue became for us. Um, but we also, I mean, we had done pretty well on growth through debt financing and so we didn't really feel we needed to take on that equity risk so that, for us. But I think it's an interesting concept to say there, I mean, we read all these surveys that the wealth management firms put out that, that the next generation wants to invest more sustainably. They don't want to just kind of do negative screen investing. And we have this sense that there's all this money willing to rush in. But for those of us who are in the space know that there's not a lot of money rushing in. So there's yeah. something keeping that from happening. And on the other hand, we see at least some brands that have really resonated with a certain market segment around sustainability. So I think that's an interesting idea. I don't know anyone's grabbed a pool of money and said, we're going to go take copper mines and turn them into sustainable companies. <laughs> but I think if someone wanted to take that on, it would be kind of an interesting challenge. I do think um, it tends to be now founders going through an evolution of what they want their legacy to be. But I haven't seen someone working on on roll-up firms, I don't know if anyone in the audience has, has that, but has seen that. But it's an interesting idea. I don't, I do, don't think it's out there yet. Um, the only thing I'd want to add, since I'm not sure how many more times I'm going to get questions tossed at me, is <laughs> the, this issue of, of exit and liquidity and legacy. A, at New Belgium, all the people who were working there were working there the next day in the same role. So the ownership structure changed, but the management structure did not change. We didn't change the board. We didn't change the management team. The, much of the money that came, that was made on the transaction has actually flowed now into a foundation because I think just the values of the people involved with New Belgium, they weren't like, hey, now I get to buy an island. They were like, wow, this is more money than I ever really expected to have. And so the foundation that's been set up is basically trying to nourish the roots that New Belgium came out of. So part of what we're, that got us all engaged is to kind of recommit to another long slog of building this company even bigger was to be a business role model. So I think I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that part of this exit was to set up a foundation to then nourish things like alternative energy, human powered transportation, 
kind of cr the craft and artisanship education that is lacking in our school system today. So we're just beginning that journey. Um, but I think it's those types of values. I mean, when we set up corporations, we imbue them with indefinite perpetual life. And yet we don't tend to think of corporations that way anymore. We tend to think of them these transactional types of things of like, how do I build them up and sell them? And I think the people that are in this room that are at this conference are trying to say, what are the different pathways to do that? And I think some of these other ideas, they're not well-trod paths. It's, you, you have to kind of dig a little bit, but there are these kind of transactions out there and you may come up with a different one for your company and be up here two years from now, I hope, to hear from what you guys have done. And I think that's a great example of deepening your impact through an ownership transition. An ownership transition involves a lot of money, generally, and it often involves millions of dollars. And New Belgium took that opportunity to create a foundation. Others who would create socially responsible businesses might take that money to start new socially responsible businesses. There's a lot of different options out there, out there for that transition. And with some of the um, options that we're discussing, like cooperatives or employee stock ownership plans, what the founders or what the current leadership wants to do, what, how they want to be involved moving forward, is a very flexible thing. For ESOPs, you can continue to be CEO when you sell. I'm, I'm not sure what happened with Campbell, but uh, it's obviously Neil, in the Neil's hands of a third. currently still CEO. So. so, I mean, there's a lot of flexibility depending on what kind of structure and who the buyers are going to be. So, um, I, I think one of the other important things to realize is that uh, like w the capital challenge that most companies get will depend on how quickly you're scaling. And we're, we're so immersed in tech and in California here that we just think everyone's going to have a 10x, 100x growth and that you need this huge amount of capital coming in. Uh, and you know, there's a lot of companies that are on much more of a steady growth pace or no growth pace at all. And, and a number of our B Corps that are in, say, the 10 to $20 million category, they're, they're looking at um, an ESOP as an option when they hit that 40 employee level or they get a little bit larger that they say, okay, that's going to be a great transition for me as a founder that I can hand it over to everyone else that's been with me through this journey that really wants to be a part of it and build in that retirement component. I think also in, in Method's case, you know, they, they were acquired uh, by Ecover, uh, another real leader in, in home, home detergents over in, in Europe and has a presence here. Uh, you know, Ecover acquired them last year, roughly the same size as Method, but Method is scaling really quickly, especially in the U.S. And when the, when the team there was looking at uh, finally exiting, because they did have private equity and they, it was going on five, six years, so it was time to find a, a, new, a new investor or a group of investors. Sure, they were probably looking at Procter & Gamble and SC Johnson and these other ones, but the conditioning with Method's values from the very start with their private equity partners and it was, it was a partnership, not just an investment, was this, this whole values piece around what is our impact. You know, Method has the most cradle-to-cradle -cradle certified products on the planet and is really trying to tackle big issues like the, the Pacific Gyre waste patch that we have going on right now. And, and to have them actually acquired by Ecover and then seeing Adam and Eric taking over head of brand and head of sustainability for both components of the, of the organization now, as well as being able to maintain uh, methods independence was a great way to look at this and say, not only are they, have they just doubled their ability for impact, but they're also building in the succession with a mission-aligned organization that had more capital to help them scale over the long term. Sure, it, it's not going to happen for every single company, but it can happen, and the intentionality around that from the very beginning was helpful in steering that direction and that choice and investment. And I think Dermot brings up a, a lot of uh, the logistics that we didn't go over, there are requirements for each of these types of transitions to work. You, you need to have achieved a certain size to use an ESOP. You need to be profitable to use an ESOP. And when you're considering these things, it's always important to talk to people who know what they're talking about. Because um, while some of these are a little bit you know, newer or more flexible. ESOPs are codified in federal law. There's a lot of things that you need to look at when you're, you have to do evaluation every year. It's a little bit pricey for smaller companies. So there are a lot of considerations that you need to take into account when you're making these decisions. And professional advice really helps with all of those. Um, I, I want to ask a, what 
you think, and then we'll open this up to questions, we'd love to hear from the audience, but what do you think about the role of debt financing versus private equity financing? I know for ESOPs, um, ownership structure and having only a few owners sell, like in the case of New Belgium, there weren't a lot of outside investors that they had to rally up and round up to sell to the ESOP. What do you think the role of having debt available to these uh, entrepreneur, social entrepreneurs versus equity available to them will play in how they transition through the first generation. Dermot, let's start with you oh, instead of Paul. Paul gets off easy. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I think the more financing options, the better, and I think that's why, like you see, look look at direct public offerings right now, and Cutting Edge Capital is doing a bunch of work there. Uh, it's super popular. So is crowdfunding, just to get that initial seed funding without any loss of equity ownership, for instance. Um, yeah, I think if you can do debt financing, it's, it's a great way to be assured that you're going to maintain mission. Obviously, it comes with a, a cost pinned to the interest rate and the like, but there is good banks out there, and there's a lot of, a lot of loans available to the smaller businesses, especially here in the United States. So, yep. For worker cooperatives, the sort of most common, in recent years, most common way of financing has been an owner-financed sale, but that obviously has pretty severe limits. And so um, in the last, I don't know, two or three years, we've seen some transitions happening using a direct public offering, um, using traditional debt financing. Um, I think we're, we're right on the frontier of figuring out a vehicle or a tool for cooperative business transition that looks a lot like ESOP business transition, but isn't, um, maybe doesn't have quite the overhead since the cooperative deals tend to be smaller. I, I mean, debt and equity are two kind of starting points and you can morph them around a little bit. I think either type of early stage financing you get, you should be thinking right from the beginning about what your goals are. And if it's important to keep control over the mission, you want to build that into the structure. At our panel earlier this morning, one of the other panelists encouraged entrepreneurs to think about registration rights. And, and I, sure, that's great as a founder to think about registration rights, but you better think about with that equity, what, what else, how can you get it back, right? Because if the only way that they can uh, liquidate their equity is by selling it to someone else, you're going to lose control. As soon as you take your first equity investor, even though it's a minority position, you've taken on all kinds of responsibilities legally to, um, I mean, it's a huge decision to, to take. I would offer, if you're gonna do equity, put in some type of redemption clause that says, if we do a mission-related exit like a ESOP, you will allow us to redeem your stock at a certain EBITDA multiple and figure that out what market is now so that you can say to the investor, that's market. If you go with debt, um, if I'm an investor, and I am, I would look at things like, I hear you that you want to do a mission-related investment, but how do I know you're not going to cheat? Take my money, build it up, and then like off you go to the races, you do a big IPO, and we just gave you debt. I would put in some kind of a negative warrant that basically says, as long as you stay mission-related, I just am a debt holder. But if you switch on me, I'm now an equity holder. So I think they're different things, and those are just ideas. I haven't seen them used a lot, although I don't see Bruce here. Bruce Campbell's done some really nice work on his blog about um, redemption provisions. He's an attorney, and uh, I, I think these things are starting to be seen. But as an investor, I'm still seeing plain vanilla, Series A, very little about what the future holds. And I think that's because entrepreneurs feel like they don't have leverage. And I think if, if you're not feeling, if control of mission is really important to you and you can't get that from your investors, you're talking to the wrong investors and you need to really hear that and back away and say, is it really gonna be worth it spending eight years of my life to build a company that isn't gonna satisfy my mission at the end? And is it better to walk away now or to walk away later? We heard a, a kind of, horrible story this morning on our other panel about building up a, a multi-billion dollar company and then having to lay off 12,000 employees because of an exit out of, out of sync with a capital structure. I mean, is that what you want to spend? When you bring in equity, you're starting to work for someone else and you need to understand, are these people you want to work for? 
So with that, let's open it up to questions. There are a couple of mics roving around, so just raise your hand and they'll come over to you. We know employee ownership is kind of a, a complicated topic, as is exiting in general, and I think that um, touching upon what, what you said, Paul, that equity, figuring out if you want investors, who your investors are, will determine your exit. It will determine your options from the beginning. So the general rule is that the earlier that you start planning all of these, all of start asking all of these questions, the better you will be in the end when you do want to go undergo this transaction because you'll have the full menu of options and you'll have directed it towards the exit that you want from the beginning. And mission is important to all these organizations that, that we're seeing here today. So make sure when you're talking to investors that you're talking, that they're speaking your language because when it comes to exit, if they're not, then you might lose some of the, mo the things that make your company what it is. So I don't see any hands in the audience unless um, you have any last minute comments from our panelists. I think I just share a little bit of con context on uh, Patagonia, and, and you know they were amongst the, the first uh, companies in California to become a benefit corporation. They're also certified, and, and you know Yvonne Chouinard and his wife Melinda are sole shareholders of Patagonia, which is now in the, the half billion dollar range, uh, and they, they have family that they can handle hand the shares off to, and which is what they're most likely to do. I don't have back end knowledge on how the will's structured or anything. But for them, they, they were looking at the company and thinking, okay, do we want to take it public? Do we want to, uh, do we want to sell it to their employees? Do we want to uh, get other investors? Or what are our other options that really keeps Patagonia's mission going for, with this heavy focus on conservation of the environment? Uh, and, and until the, the policy passed on Benefit Corporation, Yvonne was really looking at, at putting it into a foundation in a, in a trust. Uh, which, which seemed like the, the most highly likely way to preserve mission for Patagonia over the long term, and, and even though the culture there is so strong, so passionate, uh, the workers love being there, the family really cares about all these issues, but what happens over time, you just don't know. Uh, and the challenge what they, they realized within the trust format, I believe in California, and, and don't quote me because I might get this wrong, was somewhere around 12 years in, a foundation in California must sell at market value a component of the shares of, of the company. And at least in Patagonia's case, that was the, uh, the direction that they were given, which meant the mission would be intact for 12 years after the, the trust took over, but then in 12 years' time, the open market had the ability, would have the ability to, um, to make a purchase, or a partial purchase of Patagonia. And then to Paul's point, you know, you now have a new group of shareholders in there because market value can really escalate. And, Ultimately, that was the choice that um, Yvonne chose when he said, I'm going to make this a benefit corporation and, and add in conditions to make sure that this mission can be intact. And yes, it probably did take a couple million or more off of their valuation because they added in so much extra language to preserve mission. But for him, that was the right thing to do because he looks at it as a land easement that hopefully will keep Patagonia going for another 50, 100, or even 250 years like King Arthur Flower is, which is one of the, the leading um, employee-owned companies in the United States. Well, thank you all for joining us today in the audience, and thank all of, my, all of the panelists here for contributing this information. We're here afterwards if you'd like to ask any questions.